even know how to do this anymore. But would you join me in the call to worship? It turns out we all know how to do this. Come, you are seeking, you who are seeking respite and hope. The voice of love is heard in every storm and dwells among us. Come, 
Let us worship God, and now would you join me in prayer. God, through wilderness wanderings and exiles, you have called your people back. We're grateful to return to this space and grateful for your presence with us through our long sojourn. Heal whatever it is within us that hurts. Revive and restore whatever within us needs to be restored. Direct our paths as we seek a new beginning. And give us all to know that peace which passes all understanding. We are grateful to have come this far, O oh God. We have been a people of prayer all along. But we ask that you would enable us to continue to be so, using the words that Jesus taught to his disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. So let's begin this way. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> this Sunday has been a long time in coming, and it's so good to see each and every one of you here. It's so good to be reminded that we can be together in this space. Every one of the transitions that we've gone through over the last 15 months, first to virtual services and then to meeting outdoors and then to live streaming and then going back outdoors and now returning inside. Each and every one of them has felt very strange initially. And as good as it is to be here, this too might feel a little bit strange to you. It does to me, if I'm honest. Masks, the space that we have between us, it's a way of being in the meeting house to which we're as yet unaccustomed. But I think it's a small price to pay to be able to gather in this space with one another. I know that I have missed seeing you here so much. We have missed seeing you so much. And it is good to be together now. I know some are continuing to watch at home. We'll try to lure you back little by little. And I, uh, well, yeah, we've made preparations for some to listen in on the, on the lawn outdoors, but uh, the last time I checked, nobody was there. Everybody came inside, so I guess that's good. One way or another, though, we are um, together, and it is a good thing. It has become our habit to begin our time of welcome with a word of poetry. And so today, I wish to greet you with the words of Rumi, a perennial favorite among many of us. Here's what he says. He says, come, come, come. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Ours is a caravan of endless, endless joy. Even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, still, and yet again, come. So ours is not a caravan of despair. We come today having been through a lot, but ours is not a caravan of despair. Among all of you, I'm guessing there are a lot of emotions, like relief, or loss, 
or uncertainty or grief or joy, just to name a few. But we are a caravan of people using the eyes of faith to piece our way through this difficult time, which is not yet over, not quite. I just want to say that whatever you may be feeling today, whatever may be on your heart, I hope that just being here can help bring you a sense of assurance that a loving spirit has guided you all along. And I hope you feel encouraged to be back together, gathered as a blessed community in the meeting house once again. Well, we don't have a whole lot of uh, extra activities to announce. Um, we're coming back slowly, though I suspect that's going to change before too long. But one thing that is coming back along with our regular uh, services here in the meeting house is the fellowship hour, a kind of minimalist fellowship hour, which is going to happen on the lawn after the service today. We won't have finger food, but there will be drinks if you'd like to partake. The ladies who stitched the Tree of Life in the Crosby Partnership for Haitian Education, they'll all be out there selling uh, their goods on the lawn. And so you can see what they have to offer while we all gather to say hello and to reacquaint ourselves with one another. Now let me say before I'm done with the announcements um, that getting back inside has been a fairly enormous effort. Until sometime last week, this place was a time capsule, dated to early March of 2020. Believe it or not, there were still old bulletins that were in the pews from 2020. And there were stewardship flyers from the fall of 2019. For all I know, you may still find one there. You can still give to the 2019 stewardship campaign if you'd like. The hymns that we sang on the final Sunday that we gathered were on the boards here. This is until last week. There has been a lot to do to get this place ready for you, and I want you to know that Mark, over here, has done an enormous amount to prepare this place. That's included getting the window fans in. It's including getting the soundboard together, stringing all those wires up the wall and all the way back there to the camera, so that we can broadcast this thing still. It's included a lot of work. But I also want you to know that our deacons and our staff have all helped us think through how to make this happen today. And I want to thank all of them as well. In particular right now, I want to thank Mary Tomasetti up there. I want to thank John Kiker for uh, helping us to broadcast all along and for keeping our community together while we've been dispersed. So Mary and John, thank you. <laughs> this is worth saying as well. When we got here this morning, we realized that we had just goofed on the bulletin. It was all jumbled. It was all out of order. None of us could remember how we used to do this. <laughs> and, and so Bob came in and made the corrections. And so thank you, Bob. I wanted to say one thing. Um, originally, when we looked at the bulletin, our opening hymn was entitled, All Creatures of Our God Now Sin. <laughs> So, Bob, thank you for catching that. <laughs> but Bob deserves an awful lot of credit for helping all throughout this pandemic as well, keeping things together. So thank you, Bob. <laughs> and then I do need to thank Carlene. I want to thank Laura as well. Laura is at a wedding this week in Chicago. Um, but to have such incredible ministerial colleagues who are not only colleagues but friends and compatriots and partners in crime is an incredible thing for a minister. So Carlene, thank you for being that colleague and partner in crime. And that certainly extends to Laura as well. Martha Gibson has organized our fellowship hour today. And so Martha, thank you for that. Um, 
We're uh, grateful for your hospitality as well. Um, we have some other deacons assisting too, Mark Bond and Amy, Amy Cabanis, and our ushers um, are those two individuals along with Dave Roberts back in the Saturday. So uh, again, thank you. And I think, um, um, Mary, are you also a deacon on duty today? Or are you just, okay, so Mary's there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, hospitality. Well, Mary, thank you for your hospitality, too. Listen, it's, um, it's a communal effort around here. Last but not least, though, let me thank each and every one of you, all of you out there, for being here now, for having been out there all along, and for hanging with us through this pandemic. I'm so grateful to have had you as a supportive and stable backbone for all that we do. I have one more thank you it's to the choir. It's great to have all of you back as well. Um, thank you for doing this uh, summer sing. Um, we've missed you. We've missed you terribly. And uh, it's great to have your voices introducing us and calling us back into the meeting house. So thank you to all of you. Well, let's close this out simply by saying it's good. It's very good to be together in this place. With that, would you rise and join me in the unison reading for today? This is a reading that we used on the Sunday, the final Sunday, that we were here in the meeting house. And so it feels appropriate to use it again on this Sunday when we're called back. Joining together, know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has come clear. Do not reach out your hands. Reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly, but we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. once again. Our first scripture lesson today comes from the book of Zechariah, chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. The prophet says, I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back, because I have compassion on them. Then the people shall become like warriors, and their hearts shall be glad as with wine. Their children shall see it and rejoice. Their hearts shall exult in the Lord. I will signal for them and gather them in, for I have redeemed them, and they shall be as numerous as they were before. Let us hope. Psalm 133 is our second reading. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life evermore. And finally, from the book of Philippians chapter 4, words that we've referred to often these past months. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Here end our readings. seated again before Carlene comes up for the pastoral prayer. I warned you that I was rusty, and I forgot to say thank you to Simon. <laughs> I could feel his ire coming down at me from the organ after that. No, I could feel no ire. Anyway, Simon, thank you for all of the ways your leadership, your music ministry has helped to get us through these past 15 months. It matters a lot. I'd like to begin with just a few lines from a poem by Maya Angelou because it spoke to me about this morning, this morning. When after a long, long time, we are back together inside this meeting house. The poet says, Here on the pulse of this new day, may you have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply, but with hope, good morning. Let us pray. Gentle and gracious God, mysterious yet imminent God, we praise you for this day. We praise you for this sacred space where we gather, for the windows that let in healing light to shine on whatever darkness we hold, for the gold leaf that reminds us that the light of wisdom, your holy wisdom, 
reflects back upon us as we seek in silence to follow the ways of truth and peace. For these benches upon which we sit once again, knowing that for generations our community has gathered here, has rested in these very places to support one another through grief and trial, and to celebrate the blessings and joys that have been ours to honor. On the table of grace and communion, we lay down the burdens we carry in the sure and certain hope that you will guide and support us in whatever trials we face. On the table of grace and communion, we place our thanksgiving and gratitude that we are here together once again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for parting the sea of despair and loneliness and confusion and leading us through. We thank you this day for yesterday's morning's gentle rain and for all that it has nourished, the lush trees that feed us with oxygen and the colorful tapestry of flowers that sustain us with beauty. We thank you for the delicate music of the songbirds that bespeak peace and for the haunting cry of the hawk that reminds us to be courageous and strong in the face of challenge. Your sacred creation is a part of the ground of our being and humbly we praise you. Let it be that all our prayers are songs of gratitude. We gather today at this altar to pray for others the world over, whose days are a never-ending trial. For those who feel unworthy, we ask you to pour your love out in waterfalls of tenderness. For those who are depressed, we ask you to shower them with the light of hope. For those who are hungry or pelted with weather because they have no shelter, we ask you to protect them and feed their bodies as well as their souls. For those who live in pain, we ask you to bathe them in the river of your healing. For those who are lonely or carry the burden of grief and sorrow, we ask you to keep them company tenderly and constantly. For those who live in the shadow of war or in the grip of a merciless authority, we ask that you be as a borderless sea of substance and mercy and give to them the most precious gift of all, peace. And in this week that is to come, we would ask that you help each and every one of us to live more gently in this world, carrying the burdens of those around us as best we can, and dedicated to making peace and relentlessly pursuing justice and truth and equality. All this we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, thy Son and our Savior and friend. Amen. response to all our blessings and in resilient hope for what might someday be possible in this world and with faith in this community to serve and to love 
The morning offering will now be received.
Let us pray. Fairest Lord Jesus, beautiful Savior, Son of God, and Son of Man, we praise you for the gift of music that heals our weary souls and that paints for us and sound a world where all is peace, where the hungry are fed and the broken restored. We are blessed in this place with a ministry of music that opens a window in our hearts and minds and souls where a vision of the eternal can be heard and touched, where we understand for just a moment that you, precious Lord, are a borderless sea of substance and mercy. Amen and thank you. During the colder months of spring, an interesting drama took place behind the parsonage, which came to symbolize something of what I felt as a minister during the pandemic. One chilly evening, Rachel and I watched as a red fox sniffed around the edges of the barn out back and then soon squeezed into a hole beneath the base of that structure. There have in the past been possums living there off and on, and so we imagined that the fox had gone hunting. But then we were surprised when several moments later, first one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five tiny gray baby foxes emerged from that same hole. The mother fox then stood in the driveway, and they all gathered around her drinking milk. In time, she shooed them away and stood off at a distance while they piled on one another and chased each other in the small grassy patch there by the barn. It was a scene that was replayed almost every morning and every evening as well. Out they would come with the mother regally standing guard a few paces away. If Rachel or I or the kids emerged from the house, she would trot into the brush while the baby stood still or scrambled for cover beneath the barn. Now, for a month or two, they were our honored guests. We felt glad to have them there and amused to see their antics every day. Once, one of those young foxes tried to drag an old children's toy underground with it, but it didn't fit. Other times, the mother fox would become exasperated, shooing her children away when she didn't feel like feeding them anymore. And there was also, I should note, a grislier aspect of their residency. Some mornings, we would awake to see the remains of a bird or a squirrel lying in the grass by the barn. There was one night that Augie was awakened by what seemed like a terrible screaming from somewhere in the back of the house, but in the morning we found nothing more than a pile of feathers. Grizzly or not, they were charming guests, and we hoped that they would stay for a while. But then late in April, we realized it had been a few days since we had seen them. Initially, we thought that our schedules may simply have been misaligned. Perhaps they emerged before we got up in the morning or after we had settled down for dinner. But in time, it became clear that they had simply moved on, leaving an empty barn and an empty yard. We weren't heartbroken, not all the way down, but we were wistful. They were very nearly the only guests that we had had in 13 months of pandemic living. But then just this week, we were making dinner and we were looking out the back kitchen window. Suddenly a young fox trotted out of the brush in the back it wasn't quite fully grown, 
And so it must have been one of those young babies that we had seen two months earlier. It poked around the garage, and then it poked around the barn, before finally disappearing into its old den for the night. One of those foxes had found its way back, and it seemed content to stay, at least for a while. What had it learned out there, I wondered? And how had it changed? And then also, what was it that made it come back? Now I share that story because it feels like a miniature version of all that's happened to us this past year. Say the meeting house is akin to the barn behind the parsonage. They're different structures, I know, but they both function in their way as a kind of protective enclave. One for the animal kingdom and one for us. Within this space here, we have felt sheltered. We have felt nurtured. And many of our needs have been met and fulfilled here. When a relationship needs to be formalized with vows, we gather here. When lives come to an end, this is the place that we bring our mourning. When we wish to bless a newborn child, we do it within these walls. When we require a place to ponder something, often this was the place that we came. When it was time to mark the changes in the year, every year, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, Lent, the meeting house helped us to mark it. When we needed encouragement or solace, or to, or to feel the support of other people. We've done it here. This room, both beautiful and also very simple, has been a place that has helped us to gather our lives, to gather our very selves. But I think this space, this room, has done more than that, too. For more than a few of us, this is the only space in our lives in which we're enabled to mix regularly with children. For others of us, it's the only space where we encounter older adults that we can get to know. For some of us, it's the only space in our lives where we're invited to make music, not as a passive observer, but as an active participant. Where else are you encouraged to stand and sing? There's more. This is just about the only public space that I know that's left anywhere ever in which a television does not occur or feature prominently. And so this is a space that's mercifully free of advertising and of images designed to sell you something. It's a space in which something that transcends us is regularly addressed something that extends beyond our material lives. Here is a space where you're invited just to consider and to be. Some among us have been doing those things in this particular place, in these walls, in these pews, for just a few years. But some of you have been marking significant events in your lives in the meeting house for the better part of your sojourn on this planet.
so it's not an exaggeration or an embellishment to say that this is a place of nurture for us all. I don't know that any of us necessarily feel that significance every single time we're here, but taken cumulatively, each of the small activities that happen here is a way of suggesting that, like those foxes behind the parsonage, we have found, each in our own way, sustenance for our life journey within these walls. And then, just like those foxes, we scattered, we dispersed, the foxes had things to learn, important things if they were to survive, and I think probably the same is true for us. The foxes learned how to hunt and to find food. They learned how to create shelter and protection for themselves. And I wonder if the same thing is true for each of us. I wonder what we've learned in the time that we have been dispersed and scattered from this space. And I wonder about the ways in which we have changed as a result of the past 15 months. Some of those changes might actually be good and necessary for us. Who have we become in our wilderness wanderings and in our exile? I'd like to take a stab at addressing some of the possible implications of the past year for our individual lives, but also for our lives, or for our life together as a community, for our spiritual life too. I'll do this in the form of questions, recognizing that each of us has had our own experiences and our own reaction to all that has occurred over this past year. But here's my first question. How, I wonder, has the pandemic changed our relationship to the environment and also to the natural world? How are we different now? There's evidence that this and future pandemics that are currently being predicted have something to do with the proximity of human and animal life in tightly enclosed spaces. And so what has the pandemic done to our understanding of the way animals are raised and treated and consumed? Given what we've now lived through and given what we now understand about the ways in which animals are treated and how damaging it has been to the environment, I wonder if our habits have or will change. I wonder if you sense a greater urgency about the precarity of the planet. Here's another question. I'm wondering how the past 15 months have changed our, your relationship to our own bodies and to our health. It's no secret that the United States is the wealthiest country on the planet, but it's also not a secret that it's also one of the least healthy, which has made us uniquely vulnerable. How has this changed your relationship to your body? I wonder if you do anything differently as a result. Well, that may seem like a question better posed by the medical community, I simply wish to note that when bodies break down, it's ministers, among others, who wind up showing up at the hospital for a visit. And I think as often as not, afflictions of the spirit, like depression or anxiety, are connected to our bodily well-being, our bodily habits. Which is to say that questions of our bodily health are questions that we in churches need to be asking of one another. How has the pandemic changed your relationship to your body? Another question. How has everything we've undergone changed our, your relationship to work? 
Has it helped us? Has it helped you to recognize the ways in which we are dependent upon the labor of other people in more than a sentimental way? Has it made us any more willing to pay more for the goods and services that we depend upon such that the value of that labor can be accounted for at last? Put differently, has this experience made any of us more committed to the well-being of low and medium wage workers, those who stock our shelves and deliver the packages that continue to arrive at our doors? Those folks have helped to get us through. Has our thinking changed with regard to labor? And what about race? How has the pandemic changed our relationship to race? It was the hideous nature of George Floyd's murder that captured the world's attention, but I think much of that was the result of the pause that the pandemic created, created in our lives. It was that pause, that interruption that allowed the horror of that scene, which was not unique, to fully settle in. I wonder if we have learned to see any better as a result of the pause we have all had. There's also this question too. The virus hit black and brown communities at a far greater rate than it did communities like our own, which are predominantly white. The word apocalypse in its most literal sense simply means an unveiling, a curtain going up. Has this past year not been just that? A curtain going up, unveiling the ways in which life and death function in our society? How has the pandemic changed our understanding of race? But there's another deeper question that begs for a response as well. How has the pandemic changed our relationship to God. I'm not talking about your understanding of God or your thoughts about who or what God might be. I'm talking about your, about our active relationship to God. I'm curious if you've prayed more than you otherwise might have done this past year. I'm interested in whether you've sensed from time to time that peace which does pass our understanding promised in the words of Scripture. I'm wondering if you've felt an encouraging hope when you've needed it most. And I'm interested to know if perhaps, just perhaps, you have felt the presence of God meeting you where you most need it in your life. I've wondered if the ways that we've each been stripped of many resources that we take for granted has opened a place in our hearts to perceive the hand of God in a way that we otherwise wouldn't have been open to. One of the things I'll remember most about this past winter, the winter of our discontent, will be rereading Victor Hugo's novel, Les Miserables. I've grown jaded about the musical, I must tell you, but the book, the book stands for me as a massive preachment delivered unto the world. And there's a scene in it, in the first half of the novel, where the orphan child Cosette is sent by her wicked caretakers out into the winter night to fetch a pail of water with scarcely a flock to cover her skin. 
She's malnourished and she's weak. And the walk to the well is long, more than a mile long. And the darkness seems to envelop and consume her. The pail that she hauls is nearly as big as she is. And so just getting to the well taxes her strength to the utmost. The child then fills the pail, shivering and cold, only to find that it's too heavy for her to move, at least far. She can go only a few steps before having to rest and to catch her breath, and she begins to despair that she will ever make it back. But then in the darkness, a stranger's hand suddenly grips the bucket beside her own, removing the better part of its weight. She hadn't sensed anybody near her, and so she's surprised when that weight is suddenly gone. That hand, of course, belongs to the person who will soon be her benefactor, Jean Valjean. But in Hugo's novel, it also represents the hand of God, silently helping that struggling child along. It's a gorgeous scene. And it's come to feel like a symbol of what we've gone through this past year, during our own long journey to the well and back again. I ask you, has it not been the hand of God that's been there all along, helping us to carry our heavy burdens? And I know there have been some heavy ones among us. Has there not been a stranger silently walking beside each and every one of us all of this time, especially when the way has been dark? Have we not, each of us, at certain crucial moments, experienced a lightening of the load that we couldn't have anticipated, one that we hadn't seen coming? I could list half a dozen times, and maybe more, when I have felt that hand beside my own. But I'm guessing you could, too. Sometimes it was a song. Sometimes it was a story. Sometimes it was watching how ordinary people were doing their part to save the day. Sometimes it was just a gentle assurance born from who knows where that even if the worst should befall us, somehow we would still be okay. I know each of us can explain those things in a lot of different ways, and faith doesn't have a corner on such explanations. But I, for one, am content to name it as God. And I'm content to breathe a prayer of thanks most nights. A lot of nights, all I can muster is just a short thank you. Thank you, breathed into the folds of my pillow as I drift towards sleep. You'll have wondered if I've ignored the scripture lessons that I chose for today, but I haven't. Because they each speak to the power of dwelling together as a community. I will signal for them and gather them in, says the prophet Zechariah, how good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity, says the psalmist. And in our absence one from another, that hasn't ceased to be true. It has never ceased to be true. I'll be interested to learn what the contours of this community shall be as we all reemerge from this experience. I'll be curious to know if there are some who find their way to a community like ours 
maybe for the first time as a result of the pandemic. And I'd be curious to know if there are some who, for whatever reason, don't find their way back. We won't be the same as we were before. But I want you to hear this. We will remain intact. We have remained intact. We will be and we have been strong together with one another. It is precisely as the psalmist says, whether we're scattered or whether we're drawn together as a community, we are blessed to have one another. What I hope is that there have been times during this whole experience that you felt that deep down in your bones. I know I have. Your encouragement, your presence out there has meant the world to me, but really to all of us. So here we are again. Many of us arriving today, just like that young fox returning to its den. We're sniffing around wondering, is it safe? Is it the same as it was? Can I find the same nurture and sustenance here that I once did? Will others come back as well? Time will tell. But I hope we each wind up doing something of what that backyard guest did this past week when Rachel and I spied him through our kitchen window. Getting the lay of the land and then digging down deep into a once and future home. Welcome back. I'm so glad that each and every one of you are here. from up here so the mic can pick me up for the camera and the folks who are at home. Friends, hear these words of benediction. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. 
Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.